Lock the doors, David. There's no escape. <laughs> well, I'm David Jeffrey, and I'm happy on behalf of the Institute for Studies and Religion for the Honors College and also the Classics Department to welcome you to this important and, I hope you'll see, wonderfully informative lecture by Dr. Michelle Brown. Uh, Michelle Brown is a professor uh, emerita from the University of London. She has also been the curator of manuscript and you know, especially of the Latin Middle Ages uh, at the British Museum and Library. And she has unparalleled experience. I feel when I'm introducing somebody like Michelle Brown that I need to sort of make allusion to John the Baptist and shoelaces and things because... I'm going to lose my head. <laughs> you didn't tell me they were that dangerous. <laughs> Uh, because that's sort of the order of magnitude of her scholarship, and she has had a tremendous influence on everyone uh, in the field. I want to tell you just a few things about her for those of you who don't know her work, because it'll help you. Students who are working uh, with the Green Scholars and the Green Scholars manuscripts almost all know this little book, which is gold for students who are coming to medieval manuscript research for the first time, because it gives you not only technical terms, but some basic codicological know-how that really helps you know what you're looking at when you see uh, a medieval manuscript. Manuscript research isn't the easiest thing in the world, but it may be one of the most exciting things in the world. And, uh, and, and Michelle Brown has shown us just how much that is so. Uh, she has concentrated most of her career on working with Anglo-Saxon and Celtic manuscripts. Uh, if you think about the period that she's been most involved in, uh, it's therefore typically between the 6th century and the 11th of the 12th century, but in fact she spans a much greater period than that. She's been, you can find her sometimes in, in uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai, uh, rummaging around with the monks. Well, I'm, I didn't know what I did it. I mean, <laughs> rummaging around with the manuscripts that the monks have collected and, and housed. Uh, and, and you can find her, uh, you know, very far north in the land of the midnight sun as well, because she is in very good working relationship with uh, libraries that are concerned with these matters, not only in the north of England and Scotland, but in, in the Scandinavian countries as well. And she's about to go off uh, to Australia to get warm, because she's well known there too, and people value the work she's done. She's visited Japan in her scholarship. She's virtually a world scholar in a way that very few people get to be. Here are some of the titles of her works. Anglo-Saxon Manuscripts, another book, The Book of CERN, Prayer, Patronage, and Power in 9th Century England, A Guide to Western Manuscripts from Antiquity to 1600, The British Library Guide to Writing and Scripts, Understanding Illuminated Manuscript, A Guide to Technical Terms, the wee volume I just showed you, A History Called How Christianity Came to Britain and Ireland, the Lion Companion to Christian Art, <coughs> and a book which is amongst my favorites and of hers and, and which relates very much to tonight's topic, In the Beginning, Bibles Before the Year 1000. Now, I've only scratched the surface here. There are many other books, and there are facsimile editions, for example, of the Luttrell Psalter and also the Holcomb Bible Picture Book. Uh, her work spans many genres as well. In fact, she's confessed to me this very day, uh, that she has committed a secret act of betrayal for a scholar. She's written a novel, <laughs> and it's just about to come out. <laughs> so, so she's a woman of extraordinary talent over a wide range, as you can see. Uh, she's also uh, a person who has not only edited, but has curated major exhibits, many major exhibits, both in Britain and here in the United States. So she has done this at the Smithsonian. She's done it at the British <laughs> Library. Uh, if you were just to take a look at people in museum studies and, uh, and the kind of credits that they run up, her credits are at the top of that list as well. She has no fear for medieval materials. In 2003, she designed and presented an exhibition called Painted Labyrinth, The World of the Lindisfarne Gospels. This has been one of the most acclaimed exhibitions ever held at the British Library. Dr. Brown is the world's leading authority on the Lindisfarne Gospels, a, a manuscript created about 50 years before the Book of Kells. And uh, there's the book, and it's a thing of beauty both on the outside and on the inside. So 
So I commend it to you, any of you who are interested in that period especially. But for the uh, average reader who's interested simply in biblical history, the traditioning of biblical materials is a gold find of information, and it's very, very well written. It has been regarded by the Guild as without peer. It's good for propping up furniture, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, some of us, some of us do that periodically. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want you to join with me, if you will, in welcoming Dr. Michelle Brown to Baylor's campus. <laughs> Well, thank you, David. That was a short introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you to ISR for hosting me here, and most of all to you for turning up the lecture and to the students that I'm going to have the pleasure of teaching paleography to um, with actual manuscripts, courtesy of the Library and the Green Scholars Initiative during the course of the week. Um, what I'm going to do tonight, uh, this isn't just a standalone lecture, it's also the first session for those who are going to be carrying on um, through the week. So I am going to inflict an hour and a half on you. Um, but I know you've got lives, and anybody who needs to just sneak out at any point, don't feel that you're going to um, disturb me. I, I, can, I can just go on and on and on and on and on. <coughs> so don't, don't worry if you, if you have to leave. But we'll aim for an hour and a half, and we'll have a Q&A of about ten minutes after that for those of you who are still... Um, still up for it, okay? And what I want to do today, we're not just here to look at pretty pictures, we're going to see quite a few of those on route, but what we're actually here to do is to think about the functions of illumination and to set them within the context of biblical manuscript transmission, but also to think about the, um, the different strategies that uh, visual material can actually help us to explore. If we think about Maritain's famous saying that music has the ability to make things more than they are, I think then with the visual tropes that we're capable of achieving um, within the artistic sphere, we're in a similar level of, of possibility. Um, Bede, for example, at the beginning of the 8th century, wrote that although there is a literal meaning of the thing, there can be many, many other allegorical, multivalent meanings. And any strategies that help you to penetrate deeper into the mystery of the text and its underlying realities has to be useful and to be employed. So that's <coughs> partly of what we're going to be looking at today. For the 1,300 years or so that we're about to be romping through, of course, many of the people um, at whom the message of Scripture was directed were not themselves literate in the sense that somebody like Bede would have understood it, of being fully cognizant with the Latin classics and patristics as far as they were then available within circulation in the original Latin tongue. Many people received their cognizance of scripture and their understanding of it through popular preaching, teaching, through songs sung on bridges and taverns, through the visuals of the dooms that greeted them as they came through the portals or looked at the, um, the walls of the churches in which they saw the performative liturgy in which books played such a visual focal role. For a higher level of audience and clientele, however, thinking about university education, let's just remind ourselves of a moment of the words, for example, of Hugh of Saint-Victor. If we were studying now in the cathedral schools of the Ile de France or the early centuries of um, the Paris University um, syllabus, we would be told by tutors such as Hugh that because we couldn't expect to own all of our secondary and primary sources, we had to hone our mnemonic toolbox in order to be able to remember as much as possible. And he would tell you that if you visualised the layout of the page, use the initials, the colour, the rubrics, the running heads, etc., to help fix the appearance of the text in your mind, that served as a key to unlocking your retention of the actual content as well. And you think things get bad occasionally with your studies? Well, just bear in mind, in Hugh's day, you would have had to compose your PhD here for oral delivery here, and you would then have to recite it in front of a lecture theatre of about 200 of your professors and peers. We were in a different level of interaction with word, sound,
sound and image. And for much of what we've been looking at, we're looking at words to be seen and images to be read. And these are strategies which I think we're only beginning to pick up again after the two-dimensional <laughs> monochrome tyranny of print um, and actually explore again cognitively within the digital environment. Okay? So I think there's lots of scope for us as scholars, as mediators, as communicators to actually excavate works and think about the materiality of them. And this is a very popular strand of scholarship at the moment. We're moving away in your generations from the idea of scholars working primarily from textual editions and moving into an environment where increasingly there are many, many images available. But these are born digital artifacts often. Okay? They're not actually the same as the real manuscripts. What they are doing, however, is generating a revival of interest in traditional skills such as paleography, the study of ancient scripts, codicology, the study of their physical receptors and transmitters, and the ancillaries of text. Because people are now actually engaging with how things look, as well as secondary versions of what they might say. Okay? So this is the world that we're moving into fast. And so it's something that I want us to think about how the images are not just the candy floss. They're not just the cherry on the cupcake. Okay? So, let's go. Now, within classical antiquity, um, with a few notable exceptions, it was considered a little naive by your average bibliophile or temple librarian to require illustration or visual mnemonics for text. We find that the earliest levels of, um, of this sort of decoration tend to come in with the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century um, experiments in translating scroll technology into codex form. If we look at something like the 4th century Nag Hammadi codices, Gnostic texts of course, or the Bruce um, papyrus that we see here, another Gnostic work, we find that we've got some rather unorthodox things going on. We've got colophon decoration beginning to be inserted into the new format of one or two columnar layouts of many of these folded paperback versions, if you like, of scrolls. The new technology that the publishers of Rome didn't want to adopt with alacrity because it actually meant imposing your text, actually spending more time working out you know, what went where. You don't just write page one, page two, page three in a codex. You put by folia down, you write page two and page seven, and then you fold them together. So you have to impose your text. Okay. But within the early stages of just folding sheets of papyrus to make little um, pamphlets of the sort that would go within your script, the sort of decoration that we first get are the things that would decorate the colophon labels on the outside of the papyrus scrolls of antiquity. The thing that would actually tell you what the contents of that volumen or liber of that rotulus were. And often they would have little dots, dashes, hedera, ivy leaves, things of that sort to decorate the colophon label. And these are the th sort of things that begin to import into early Christian and Gnostic codices in order to articulate major text breaks, intricates, explicates of text. With the Bruce papyrus, we're looking at something rather different. Here we're talking about a context in which the whole um, amuletic approach, if you like, towards text is being explored. And we can see here that the, um, the ancient Egyptian ankh cross is being imported and used for um, different purposes within the Gnostic tradition. So drawing upon a rich visual tradition of a different faith. When we look at the Codex Sinaiticus, um, apart, what, what strikes you first and foremost about the appearance of Codex Sinaiticus? What leaps off the page at you? Yeah, even con size. It's a big book. It's a grand book. It's got very, very wide margins. The production values are very high. It's got no decoration, no use of colour. Okay. Very occasionally, slightly enlarged um, uh, letters in, in the uncial script, but um, very, very limited. And look at the number of columns. Does that look unusual to you? Yeah, okay, now this is basically importing an unfurled scroll technology into the new codex format, 
Okay, it promotes light at uh, eye skip, so pretty quickly they rationalise it down to the one or two columns. But this is the sort of book that finally, on his, or almost on his deathbed, the great biblical scholar Theodore Skeet, one of my predecessors at the British Museum Library, actually came out and said, yes, he thought that Sinaiticus could be one of the actual volumes commissioned by Constantine from Eusebius in Caesarea, one of these wonderful 50 copies of scripture to fill the great basilicas in the new Rome, Constantinople, and places like the Church, the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Now, big buildings like that, in a religion of the word, need big books as their focal point. So our little papyrus folded volumes aren't quite going to hack it any longer in the high altars of these great buildings. And so the whole production value, etc., begins to change as part and parcel of the whole codification and canonization of text that takes place once the methodical Roman Empire starts getting to grips with what it's beginning to sign up to as its state religion. Now, something rather different has happened between the mid-4th century Caesarean Codex Sinaiticus and the Lindisfarne Gospels, which I think was made on a little tidal island off of the north coast of England on the border with Scotland, Holy Island or Lindisfarne, around 710 to 720. And this particular statement could only have happened on the edges of the known world. It's a statement, in a way, of the apostolic mission having reached fruition as far as the then known West was concerned. Sorry guys, you, go, you were gonna have to wait a wee bit longer. Um, <laughs> but this is a statement of the contribution that is being made by those Northern cultures, newly entered into the Christian ecumen, mixing with cultural statements that stretch to the deserts of Syria, Judea, and Egypt. We're going to be exploring that a little bit further on. So a reinvention of the world in the aftermath of the Roman Empire, where new regional identities are emerging and being explored in relation to centre and to liminal margins. And when we look at the different assembly of motifs in something like the opening pages of the Lindisfarne Gospels, we're looking at something which in a way is akin to the great ship burial at Sutton Hoo or this burial that was found on a roundabout at South End in Essex recently, um, Prittlewell, uh, where the person commemorated here at the beginning of the 7th century who uh, is buried with little Lombardic gold crosses on his eyes. He's newly converted Christian, but bringing the whole panoply of his pagan past into um, the commemoration of his death, where basically his stuff is signalling the world stage and his world view. So when he adorns, uh, or those burying him adorn the chamber with silverware from Constantinople, with um, bowls from Coptic Egypt, with Rhenish glass drinking horns, with ancestral um, pieces, harps, etc., from um, the Scandinavian north, with coins from every mint in um, post-Roman Gaul, he's making a statement about his different points of reference. Now, for him, that may have been primarily a trading, a materialistic focus. But for the scribes and artists of work such as this, they're using that whole semiotic of what things signify to people who for centuries have used appearance of what they wore, the metalwork that they wore, their weaponry, the, the ink with which they tattooed themselves to actually make statements about their belief systems, their social hierarchy, their status, their profession, etc. So they're used to having the bells rung in their minds and all of these strategies are being deployed successfully by new Christian exegetes and artists. We find that the external visual semiotics are also extremely important. Something like the Lindisfarne Gospels would probably originally have been contained in either a treasure binding or a kumdach, a shrine of this sort, emulating those of the early churches of Armenia, for example, in the Christian Orient. However, visual semiotics can often have a backhander to them as well. This was made around about 800 to contain a gospel book the size of the Lindisfarne Gospels. Once the book was inside there, it was designed never to open. 
The book was entombed within its own reliquary. And it was the significance of the knowledge of the text within and the power of association with a saint whose um, role in society could carry with it miracles of healing, transformed legal processes, um, different social structures that is being signalled by the external appearance of something like the carpet pages inside the book appearing on the outside. Salutary to remember that 50 years after it was made, it was thrown into an Irish loch, Loch Kinnail, by a disgruntled Viking raider who tore it apart to find that all it contained was an old book. One society's ultimate iconic statement of autoritas, of enshrinement of ideals, is not necessarily that of another. This process begins early. This is the Freer Gospels, which is, if you like, the first um, book that we have that uh, combines the four canonical Gospels within one set of binding boards in the late 4th, early 5th century in Egypt. Within two centuries, its original binding boards, again, had been adorned with paintings in hot wax, the encaustic icon technique, with the four evangelists dressed as deacons, bearing each act of their own individual witness in jeweled bindings, in draped hands for the performance of the liturgy, the liturgical readings. And again, the metalwork at the head, designed to make the book sealed for posterity, never to be opened the external visual appearance and the messaging implicit within the witness of the four gospelers and the role of the book in performative liturgy being what ensured it rather than the direct access and study of the text. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because the role of mediating the text to that broader community would not take the form of allowing them direct access to contemplate those words which they did not have the paleographical skills to deal with um, but in terms of the social enshrinement and the enactment of the power of logos within their societies. And it's the visual elements that largely perform that function. This is the epiphany service at St. Catherine's Sinai, showing again the, the way in which um, books all with a, a very venerable pedigree, both textually and with the church figures with whom they had a direct association, playing a prominent part within the performance of the liturgy. Now, the earliest dated illuminated manuscript is the Rabula Gospels from, um, sorry, the Rabula Codex from Beth Sagba in Syria, which is dated to 586 and signed by the scribe Rabula. And this, of course, is the Peshitta text. The Syriac text worked from the Hebrew um, uh, sources. And this is the earliest example that we have of a full iconography of the crucifixion with Stephaton and Longinus within the apocryphal Eastern tradition, which would be transported to the Celtic um, West very shortly after. And we can see quite a complex visual narrative already established by this time. So what's the backstory? How do we get from our um, Nag Hammadi codices and the Bruce um, papyrus to something as fully formed as the Rabula Codex? Well, we've got some tantalising fragments to go on. Um, the charioteer papyrus, which is thought to have been made in Alexandria in the 5th century, is a rare example of what may be early illustrated um, classical texts. It's possible that we're looking at part of the Iliad, for example, that's being illustrated here in a papyrus um, form. And it's this sort of work that seems to lie behind the inspiration of some of the earliest Christian didactic imagery in book form, such as the Septuagint Cotton Genesis, again from Alexandria around about um, uh, 400. And anybody care to have a stab at that iconography for me? It's not enough to go from, is it? It's, it's Abraham encountering the angels. And when we think about the background of the style of things like this and also the Quedlinburg Itala fragment, which is um, an illustrated version of the old Latin text of the Bible produced in Rome in the 420s and 430s. Here we've got Samuel uh, arriving in his two-horse mobile <coughs> here and um, the, the murder of the, of the king 
uh, at the bottom here. And for the sources of, of this sort of extensive cycle of illumination, we have to look to other media, things like the Esther frescoes in the um, synagogue at Dura Europus, again from Syria, from a slightly earlier date, from um, uh, pre-244, for the sort of background for this extensive narrative cycle. Stylistically, for the painting style, with things like the um, Virgil from the Vatican that we see here of the Aeneid, this is the departure from Troy, um, we're looking to things like the fresco style of Pompeii, this is Terentius Neo and his wife, the baker and his wife, looking very erudite with their wax tablets and scrolls before the eruption of Vesuvius in 79. So we're thinking about books coming out of the tradition, as one might expect, of the frescoes, the mosaics, etc., of the late Roman world. And here we've got um, Virgil shown in an author portrait in a, um, a piece from the early 5th century, which Martin Hennig has actually said might have come from Britain. I think that's partly because it's drawn so badly, but <laughs> <laughs> that's another story. I don't buy that. We'll look at that later. And these beautiful rustic capitals related to um, contemporary Roman epigraphy. And this is a sort of capsa in which you would store your papyrus um, scrolls for uh, transport. So, of course, the, the logistics of actually consulting works in scroll form and the ability of pigments to actually adhere to a rolled surface all, again, play a part in limiting um, uh, that, that sort of uh, earlier manifestation. If you're popping off to Ostia Antica for a little light reading holiday and you want to take off its metamorphoses, you're going to have to take the equivalent of four Victorian hat boxes and rely on your colophon scrolls to impress your friends when you want to <laughs> recite the passage which you've conveniently memorised earlier because no Romans, if they could help it, would ever read directly in public from something. They would practice it first, orally. So imagery has a limited place there. But we can see now that even the classics are beginning to be illustrated in Rome. Now, within Constantinople and Syria during the late 5th and 6th century, we find that visible consumption of wealth becomes part of the whole process of establishing these important focal points. And we're reminded of the words of St. Jerome, for example, who criticises the uncial script, uncialis, for being so wasteful of membrane that it could be an inch high. And his words that rather than spend your money on decorating your parchment with purple in the imperial style and gold and silver script, you would do better to read the words of the text and spend your wealth doing the good works that are exhorted therein. The librarian in me is still rather glad that they did produce these books, so that's an awful thing, I know. <laughs> and here we have the great deluge, the flood. Um, this is probably, this is where it gets really silly. This is one, probably the most expensive form of book you could ever, ever produce. This was made in um, Constantinople, around about 600, the golden cannon tables. And this is impregnated with powdered gold. Now, if you think about rolling gold leaf thin, in the 15th century, they tell you how many florins it needs to gild a soccer pitch, basically. And you need about 50 times as much powdered gold to actually lay on in ink form. So you're going to spend an absolute fortune to produce something like that, uh, let alone the treasure bindings, such as these in Dumbarton Oaks from the Zion treasure, um, to, to make that, that big statement. But in a world where imperial dignity is still very, very much the benchmark, the desire to actually elevate the word of God to an even higher status, if you like, is something that gets to ridiculous lengths. And we find these purple codices throughout the, um, the, the major patriarchates of the Greek-speaking world, and also finding emulation in things like this from Kent from the 8th century. Again, people trying to emulate Byzantine orthodoxy by the way in which they decorated their works. And this could apply also to schismatic groups. This is the, um, the Gothic Bible, probably made for the Arian uh, Theodoric in Ravenna in the early 6th century, now in Uppsala, where you can see again that they're trying very much to look like Constantinople, although the text is the first attempt made in the 4th century by the missionary Ulfilus from Byzantium to actually use um, the language of a newly converted people to actually help embed 
reception of scripture. And as we look at the churches of the Christian Orient in those early centuries from the 6th through 9th century, we find the development of a rhetoric of their own local styles, not only of churchmanship and of commentary, but also of script and of visual styles. This is an Armenian piece, for example, very distinctive, although its seat of um, wisdom with the virgin and child shown fully frontally is a direct quote from Constantinople's works. This is the sort of thing that you might find in Macedonia, um, in glagolitic script with characteristic Byzantine headpieces, but in local provincial style. And this is um, characteristically Ethiopic. This was for a long time thought to be the earliest um, illuminated Ethiopic text, a prized possession of the Aksumite royal family dating to around about 1400 in our calendar. Now, the problem with a lot of the Eastern material is that it's preserved in later copies, which we normally have to argue are so conservative that they may well represent what was around earlier. So if I, for example, want to track Eastern influence in Ireland, I'm often looking at 15th century things and having to say, ah, oh, yes, but they were around a lot earlier in that form and thinking, I hope, you know, <laughs> keeping your fingers crossed. Um, but there's, there have been a, um, a few breakthroughs recently, and this is one of them. Have any of you heard of the Abuna Garama Gospels? There's been a little bit about them in the press recently. They were kept in a closed monastery on the top of an incredible mountain in Ethiopia, where women certainly are not allowed to go. Again, that will be something to do with rummaging in monks. <laughs> I've got bad habits, but not that bad. Um, anyway, so the Garama Gospels were thought to be another one of these 14th, 15th century um, Ethiopic works in Gez. And um, I took a punt and said, well, I actually thought that from the style of illumination that it could actually be much earlier. This is the sort of provincial manifestation of the sort of influences of Justinian's court, for example, that would be appropriate at an early stage. And because it wasn't actually in institutional ownership and they could undertake um, the sort of testing that we as librarians um, obviously can't do because it's destructive, uh, they were able to carbon-14 date it when it went for conservation. And the radiocarbon dating is plus or minus 600. So you've got a tolerance of, of about 90 years either side. So, yep, this is the real McCoy, Ethiopic, circa 600. And you've got this wonderful depiction of the Holy of Holies, the um, tabernacle within the temple, the canon tables, and evangelist miniatures. So this, again, is helping us to reappraise some of and test those hypotheses. Um, another cultural manifestation might be a little bit more surprising. Christian Arabic material from the time of the Islamic conquest of the seventh century onwards, when Arabic becomes the first language of many Christians um, within the eastern and southern Mediterranean. Again, reflecting that Byzantine centrality in the accoutrements of colophon decoration, headpieces, evangelist images, etc. Now, this is, if you like, a little bit more of an intellectualised response to some of those um, traditional uh, uh, features rather than just aping them in your own local style. This is the Great Bible produced at Canterbury <coughs> in the 830s, 840s, the Royal Bible, when the Vikings are already at the cat flap of Kent. And this is a book which is referring to its worldview. Here you've got Christ Pantocrata, a direct quote from the mosaics of Santa Polinare in Classe in Ravenna from an earlier period. This is a quote from a Carolingian court school manuscript of St. Luke's bull depicted in an illusionistic landscape. And here you have the sort of metalwork um, that the well-dressed man about town on the streets of Canterbury would be wearing in the 830s or so. The whole of it set in purple pages um, representing the apse mosaics with the enshrinement of Logos on the high altar in a two-dimensional page. So quite a sophisticated magpie borrowing of different cultural resonances to align your culture with both the imperium of ancient Rome mediated through Constantinople and that of the Carolingian Empire, but placed ultimately at a higher authority. So where does that come from? 
Well, this is the earliest insular illuminated manuscript from Britain or Ireland. The Cathach or Battler of St Columba, which was thought for a long time to be the actual book penned in St Columba's own hand, he dies in 597, that caused the first international copyright scandal, the first IPR infringement case. When Columba, a great prince of the Irish O'Neills, as well as a prince of the church, was accused of plagiarising an edition of the Psalter by his master, Finian of Moville, from another tribe. Two tribes go to war as a result of the jurist's um, claim to every calf, it's cow, it's calf, to every book, it's copy. Columba, you're in breach of copyright. He can't accept that, he goes to war. Um, the bloodshed that entails ensues, leads him to set off in the boat in with no oars on Peregrinatio, voluntary exile to Christ, that leads to the establishment of Iona, Lindisfarne, and many, many other monasteries throughout Europe. And we can see that within this book, which probably dates to shortly after his death, around 600, you've got different things happening. You can see that the initials are starting to spring out and catch your eye. You've got a diminuendo taking you down from their enlargement to the size of the text fonts. You've got Christian symbolism, ichthus, the fish, and the cross creeping in. And you've got new things too, visual legibility and grammar, not only of ornament, but of text. Irish scribes of this period responsible for introducing systematic punctuation systems, word separation, part of the experience of the newly converted, newly literate, to actually trying to learn Latin as a foreign language and write it. The minute they start doing that, they, for Latin, they start doing it for their own language and their own rich oral tradition, making Old Irish and shortly after it Old English the earliest Western vernaculars as a counterpart to those of the Christian Orient. And their own native repertoire of Iron Age, Latin, spiral work and other ornament, again, coming into frame. Now, the Columban mission, obviously, is playing a key role coming in from the West. The sort of books that are coming from Rome to Gaul to Britain at this time are works such as this in Oxford, Codex Oxoniensis, a mixed Old Latin Vulgate text where you can see beautiful unsealed script, but the decoration, again, confined simply to a little bit of colophon decoration, still very much looking to the classicism of late antiquity. Other books that we think um, Augustine brought with him, however, a little bit jazzier. This is the Augustine Gospels, now in Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and it's the book upon which the Archbishops of Canterbury swear their oaths upon coming into office. So it still functions liturgically. And here we have St. Luke shown as a classical author, identified by his symbol, the bull. And here we can see portals with scenes from the life of Christ showing the passion narrative. Open like the doors of the great portals of Santa Sabina in Rome with their wooden carvings, which was a basilica much frequented by Augustine and Gregory the Great. And the big opportunity for Western use of imagery, as well as the sort of um, decorative navigation aids that we've been seeing, really comes with Gregory the Great, who around 600 writes a letter to the iconoclast bishop of Marseille, Serenus, saying, stop knocking the um, heads off of statues, please, for it is one thing to adore a picture, another to learn what is to be adored, through the history told by the picture. What scripture presents to readers, a picture presents to the gaze of the unlearned. For in it, even the ignorant see what they ought to follow. In it, the illiterate read. The doors wide open like Santa Sabina for the use of didactic Christian imagery and the course of Western history of art is set. This from the Augustine Gospels, again, showing the sort of strip cartoon narratives that are being produced from those earlier manuscripts that we've seen during Gregory the Great's rule. Now, some of the work that I've been doing in Sinai recently shows that um, Gregory's response, I think, is very mold much moulded by the Eastern experience of icon writing. This is one of the great icons produced at Sinai in the 6th century, Christ Pantocrator, 
painted in hot wax, just melts. It's, it's so luminous as an image. Still, again, used liturgically. And see how the treasure binding of the book functions within the autoritas of Logos, Christ incarnate. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the very embodiment of Logos. And this is the monastery where such works were being made. Anybody been to the Sinai? But don't go there at the moment because it's not the safest of places. In fact, when the Arab Spring broke and it was too dangerous for the military and um, police to patrol the Sinai, the peoples who at one time had lived in the remains of the barrack blocks that you see outside there, who were posted from the Black Sea in Europe to guard the monks by Justinian in the 6th century, stepped into the breach and said, Justinian told us to protect Catherine, the security of one of the most volatile places on the planet, safeguarded by 6th century orders from Constantinople. Um, what has this place got to do with anything? Well, if you wanted to visit the Holy Land during the Middle Ages, you had to go to Catherine. It was given in the 7th century, we think, um, a donation, uh, probably a late 7th century forgery, but attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, giving the monks right to dwell and saying that anybody who was visiting the monastery could have unimpeded right of passage throughout Islamic territory. So it becomes a very important um, centre. Uh, but of the many... Oh, I can't resist showing you this. Of course, the reason that the uh, monastery is there is because it stands at the foot of Mount Horeb where Moses encountered the Lord in the burning bush and received the tablets of the law. This is a cutting of the burning bush that stands at the eastern end of Justinian's Basilica. Um, we'll pass over the dodgy theology of the <laughs> Should the Lord come again? <laughs> um, the incredible polyglot library at Sinai of about 3,000 volumes <coughs> contains many, many different linguistic groups. There were many monks who set up monasteries within the monastery, be they Christian <coughs> Arabs, be they um, Georgians, um, Macedonians, Syriacs, uh, as well as the, um, the Greek-speaking monks at the core. But what was always thought to be missing were things from the Latin West, because the communication in the post-Roman world was thought to have been disrupted to such an extent that the West doesn't have direct contact with the East until the Crusades. And the rhetoric, rhetoric of Crusades still, obviously, um, it features in the reporting of East-West relations um, today. But I figured this was wrong, and I played a hunch and got the monks to let me go out there for a month. And so far, I've found 50 early Latin manuscripts and rising. And there isn't one of them that doesn't rewrite East-West relations, um, including this six-level palimpsest, what I call my Sinai sandwich, mm -hmm. which has 5th century Greek um, New Testament written in Sinai at the lower level, um, erased because skins are at a premium, overwritten by two Italians from Gregory the Great's Rome, then overwritten, in turn, by two Northumbrians from Northern England from about the time of the Lindisfarne Gospels in the 8th century, overwritten, in turn, by a Christian Arab in the monastery around about 900. A Sinai sandwich, showing that those Westerners were actually present within the monastery, and that Gregory the Great, as I've now found, himself established a monastery within a monastery and endowed 15 places for Westerners. So far more direct contact than we'd um, ever been led to believe. And this little initial here, which is part of the passion narrative in Latin, is a Persian senmerv, which combines um, bird, beast, and fish features to show how the different elements come together. So watch this space. There's interesting stuff there. And when we look at some of the early Celtic monasteries in Ireland and compare them with their Egyptian counterparts, we can see that some of these direct parallels become more than parallels. We are also talking about direct contact on, on occasion. When we look at the earliest cult book of St. Columba, the Book of Darrow, probably made on Iona around um, the 670s, we are looking at one level at a little man who's a belt buckle on legs. That would look very good at the belt of one of our warriors buried in Prittlewell. But I don't think it's just that. It's one level of visual illusion, but I think they're also intending to allude to the vestments of the Christian Orient, such as we see in this Armenian manuscript, the Priest's Gospel in Baltimore. 
And when we look at the Virgin and Child in the Book of Kells from Iona circa 800, we've departed from the Byzantine full frontal iconic image to the sidewards form favoured in the Coptic Church. And this is a very distinctive Coptic form. Um, when the Copts moved into the ancient Pharaonic temples, they didn't stop to redecorate. They relabeled, they rebranded a lot of the imagery that they found. So, for example, Isis and Horus um, become the Virgin and Child, the weighing of souls by Thoth becomes Saint Michael and the weighing of souls, etc. And if we look at accoutrements such as the liturgical flabella that we see here, that are used for keeping flies off of the Eucharist in the Middle East, well, certainly midges on Iona can be pretty tough in September, not as bad as fire ants. <laughs> but, um, but nonetheless, we're looking at something that is, is a, a direct quote, and it's said that Columba had um, a liturgical flabellum from the East as one of his relics. So again, you can unpack some of these images to actually um, recreate something much wider in terms of how you appreciate the role of these books and the references that are coming into the world of those who made them. I'm going to speed up a little bit now and skip some of the... Um, the images as we go on. Um, this is uh, a book made by women, I think, because women, of course, were producing books as well at this time. Um, it's made, I think, by the nuns of Minster in Thanet in Kent, where Augustine made landfall. It dates to the 730s. It's a Romanum Psalter depicting King David playing his lyre, like the one we've seen in Prittlewell, whilst his scribes take notes on wax tablets and scrolls. And this is the earliest appearance in art of a historiated initial, where text and image are so intimately entwined that the very letter tells a story. This is um, David and Jonathan shaking hands. And between the lines of the Uncial script, we find the earliest surviving translation of any part of the Bible text into the English language. Um, this was an interlinear Old English gloss that was added in Kent in the um, middle of the 9th century to a book that was about 100 years old at that time. Um, I haven't time to go into that. Uh, the sort of books that we find produced in Gaul and in Britain um, in response to these varied influences range from gospel books such as this to commentaries such as Bee's wonderful commentary on the book of Proverbs, his um, commentaries on the tabernacle, the temple, etc., would have been written in manuscripts such as this at Monk Wearmouth Jarrow in the north of England. And this is um, uh, a book, a second-hand book, that was a, a, an apocalypse commentary owned by St. Boniface, the missionary to the Germans in the 8th century, whose own handwriting is there, and later it passed to St. Dunstan, whose handwriting is there. Um, so different grades of books with different visual uh, attention paid to them in accordance with their status. Now this is one of two churches that were produced um, in Northumbria in the 670s to 680s. Have you heard of Monk Wearmouth and Jarrow before? Okay. This is the 7th century fabric of Monk Wearmouth, produced by Gaulish masons and glaziers. And the sort of interior decoration there would have been inspired by things like the great basilicas of the Lateran and Santa Maria Maggiore, themselves, again, very much inspired by early manuscript art. And when we look at Santa Maria Maggiore, if you can imagine a provincial but equally stunning in its way version of that in Monk Wearmouth, uh, the artifacts that Benedict Biscop and Chalfrith brought back from Rome and Gaul on their six visits there in the 7th century created not only an incredible statement in the British landscape, but created a library that was the best resource in the Western world. They'd salvaged a lot of material, we think, from Cassiodorus's <coughs> Vivarium, as well as other places on the continent, and it was this that allowed somebody like Bede to become the preeminent biblical scholar of his day. And this is a manuscript that we think preserves the style of some of the panel paintings that were hung on the walls of Monk Wearmouth. Um, <coughs> Bede tells us that, for example, on this wall, there were apocalypse images, panels brought back from Rome. And this is thought to be a Carolingian copy of a Wearmouth Jarrow manuscript that contained that fresco cycle. Another great thing produced at Weymouth Jarrow in the beginning of the 8th century, of course, were the three great Chalfrith Bibles. Now, have any of you ever handled a big Romanesque Bible or anything of that sort? 
No? Yeah? They're big, aren't they? They are heavy things. If you want to make a single volume Bible before the 13th century, you need about six people to lift it. They're not the sort of books that you use readily, either for consultation liturgically or for study. When you make a big single volume Bible of the sort that they're producing at Weymouth Jarrow in the 8th century, you're making an authoritative statement. A Bible is a biblios, it's a library. What you contain between those two sets of balls is an authoritative statement on which are the canonical texts and which are the best editions of them to be preserved as exemplars for copying for other works to be disseminated. Normally, we'd have separate books. You would have a Psalter, you would have a Gospel book, you would have an old, uh, a New Testament, or a set of epistles, etc. You would divide up um, in different ways, a Pentateuch, etc. So to have something in um, this form is an authoritative statement. And this is what is being done at Weymouth Jarrow in Bede's day. In 716, he said that his beloved abbot Chalfrith set off for Rome, taking with him one of three massive single-volume Bibles, Pandex, the best attempt of scholarship to actually reconstruct Jerome's Vulgate from numerous sources. They weren't just copying one source textually. Okay? At the time of the Council of Trent in the 16th century, when the Catholic Church um, needed to ascertain what version of the Vulgate they were going to print, the scholarly team who did the research announced that this book in Florence, the Codex Amiatinus, which Chalfrey <coughs> took with him as a present to the Pope in 716, was the best approximation of Jerome's original work undertaken in Bethlehem and Caesarea in the 4th century. The library resources transported to those outer aisles capable of producing something which goes in disguise. It wasn't until the 1880s that this book was recognised as having been produced in the islands. It was thought to be made in Italy by Italo-Byzantine artists and scribes. So good is the text, so wonderful is the script, and so illusionistic and classicising are the images of Christ at the Last Judgment flanked in the apocalypse um, by the signs of the beasts and also the evangelist symbols. The wonderful diagrams of the temple and tabernacle, the incredible uncial script laid out in Cassiodorus's Coloret Comata layout. And this incredible image. Now this is a good example of a multivalent image of the sort that Bede is talking about. At one level, this is Ezra the scribe. The Old Testament scribe who is said to have remembered the Hebrew scriptures and to have written them down after they were burnt by the Babylonians. Um, at another level, it's Cassiodorus, the armorium that we see open behind him with the nine-volume edition that Cassiodorus produced, the Novem Codices. But if you look at the spines, it's not. It's Augustine. It's Oregon. It's all the various transmitters of scripture. And this figure becomes not only Ezra, but Cassiodorus, Chalfrith, Bede, and any of you who look upon that image and become yourselves transmitters of that ongoing process of biblical transmission. The book serving as an ambassador to the heart of um, the Roman world, showing that the apostolic mission was come of age and that the churches of the north were now part of that international orthodoxy of Chalcedon. This was the year when Iona finally relinquishes its obdurate Celtic ways and comes into the fold, when Naples is recovered from the Arians, when Aquileia is recovered, when all of the schisms look like they're being healed. And this is an authoritative statement actually encapsulating that. Now, I'm not going... Oh, I, yes, I, go, I can go till six, can't I? Yes, you said an hour and a half. Right, you asked for it. Keep going. Okay. Now, this is the Lindisfarne Gospels. This is made in um, Lindisfarne, about 30, 40 miles away from Weymouth Jarrow, a decade or so um, after what we've just been looking at. And you can see, if you look at the style of this image, that there's obviously a relationship between this figure yeah, and this one. But different things have happened. First of all, the armarium is replaced by Polonius behind the curtain. <laughs> And many ways of, of thinking what's going on here. One level of interpreting this is that it's the temple curtain drawn aside at the crucifixion to allow the um, reinterpretation of the Old Testament and the writing 
of the new. Um, from the time that this image first began to be known in the 18th century, Strutt referred to it as a monstrous barbarity. We now think of the work in something like Linda von Gossens as being incredibly complex, sophisticated and beautiful, but we've had the experience of Picasso, the Cubists and others um, uh, to actually help inform us. Um, but this is a sacred figure. It's a sacred diagram, placed like a Coptic icon framed on the page. And if you looked at that pink background, you would see that it was polished with a dog's tooth to make it look like an encaustic wax icon. This is not designed to be an illusionistic image. It's replete with meaning, and it's intended to look like an icon. Look at the transliterated Greek that we have here. Oios Mateos, Imago hominis, the idea of the image, the icon of the man, etc. Um, and when we think about the words that would have inspired the maker of this book, the Lindisfarne Gospels, unlike something like the Codex Amiotinus, which has um, six scribes and a number of artists, is the work of one artist scribe, who we think was the bishop of Lindisfarne, Eadfrith, who died in 721. Now imagine him making the most co one of the most complex books in the world, which is, again is a remarkable work of scholarship, as well as the act of making. When you're a busy bishop who's running a, a diocese that stretches <coughs> from just north of York to Edinburgh, when you're engaged in humanitarian aid program work and actually getting your hands dirty in the field in one of the most plague-ridden, war-torn areas and centuries, um, the spirituality, the manual work, this prayer study time, all of that coming together, it must have taken him at least five years to actually carve out the time to produce this incredible book. And as we'll see, it's replete with theology and with social messaging. And the sort of words that he would have had in mind, perhaps, when he's making a work such as this, are the words of Cassiodorus, that the scribe preaches with the pen and unleashes tongues with the fingers, that each word written is a wound on Satan's body, not a domestic activity, the spiritual front line. Could be in the sage of Iona, that when you copy the words of scripture, you ruminate, ruminatio. You then lead to meditatio, which if you do that successfully enough, unleashes revelatio, that moment of the appreciation of the big picture that's too much for the human frame to take for more than that split second, but which opens up that transformative power within the world. That's what making something like this is about. And that as you go, you fill the shelves of your inner library with things needful to know. You can't Google everything. Mm -hmm. Some things you imbibe and you live your life by. And that in so doing, you make of yourself a living ark. These are the sort of things that illuminated books of this sort help encapsulate. Bye, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you for coming. And this is the place where it was made. A little island on the super highway of its day. Water. No, the rest of you can't go. Just, uh, I didn't mean it earlier. <laughs> Water, the great communication system of its day. And this is where I think this incredible book was made. This little lump of rock, Cadizal, in the bay of the monastery, where for the 40 days of Lent and the Advent season, even the busy bishop was allowed to go on spiritual retreat to enter the desert of the book and preach with the pen in the manner of Eastern fathers who made books single-handedly as a penitential Lenten exercise. Rather than in the communal, oh, bye bye. <laughs> rather than in the communal scriptoria that would apply to other monasteries such as Weirmouth Jarrow and those which followed the rule of St. Benedict or other more communal rules of life as opposed to places like Iona and Lindisfarne, which followed the more eremitic rule of the Desert Fathers. Okay, bye guys. Have a nice time. Bye. So, the Lindisfarne Gospels, like the Codex Amiotinus, one of the best versions of the Vulgate text <coughs> that has survived to us. Again, with Old English added between the lines in the 950s, the oldest surviving Gospels in the English language. Ah, oh, you're all going. <laughs> it's all right. I know, an hour's long enough, isn't it, really? Okay. Are the rest of you up for a bit longer? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, cool.
Now you've really got to want to make a book like Linda's Farm look the way it, it does. This is another book copied from the same textual exemplar where you can see, for example, the letters of the name Christ in Greek, Cairo, written quite modestly as opposed to the Lindisfarne Gospels, which treats it like this. <laughs> so, you know, obviously there's something else going on here. The Vulgate isn't an authorised version of the text either. This is a book made in Lindisfarne um, 20 years or so later, which copies the artwork, but has a very different Columban-style um, mixed Latin text. So they're looking at different texts, they're not just um, following one. But Lindisfarne chooses to elevate the Vulgate to a new, um, a new status. These are the canon tables in the front of the volume, which give a, almost a concordance system, which actually compare and harmonise the Gospels, set within the chancel of a church on the high altar, the Holy of Holies, rather <coughs> as in the Book of Kells, these pages which bring together the four evangelist symbols arranged around the chi, which is the first letter of Christ in Greek, um, again serve as a visual statement of the harmony of the different gospelers. Each of the gospels and the book as a whole are prefaced in the Lindisfarne Gospels by cross carpet pages. Now, these were described as that by art historians because they look like um, Persian rugs. In actual fact, I found um, that from Bede that we were actually using prayer mats in Northern Europe at that time. Um, that on, Ho on uh, Good Friday on Holy Island in 720, you'd have spent much of the day praying in an easterly direction, waiting for the resurrection on your prayer mat. Part of the liturgies of the Christian Orient um, that obviously Islam picks up on that aspect subsequently of the use of the prayer mat as well. The first opening carpet page is the Latin cross, reinforcing the idea of the Vulgata, the Latin tradition, but painted in an antique Coptic fashion, recollecting the work of, um, of, um, of the editor within the East, modelled on Coptic carpet pages such as this. Each of the Gospels has a different cross within it. Matthew has the Latin, um, Mark has the Celtic ring head, um, Luke has the Greek cross, and John has Ethiopic and Coptic towers. The idea of different traditions of churchmanship coming together within that harmonised ecumen of reconciled orthodoxy, in the same way as different lection systems are preserved and marked by the initials to show different liturgies coming together and um, agreeing in the performance <coughs> Of the liturgy. And the shared sort of um, late antique roots of such motifs find <coughs> echoes in other cultures such as early Qurans and Hebrew carpet pages and headpieces such as we see in the 15th century Lisbon Bible or the 14th um, century uh, Sultan Baybar's Quran. Now in the Lindisfarne Gospels I think the carpet pages perform the function of where you take off your shoes spiritually for entering the ground of sacred text. They're metalwork allusions referring to the rich um, enamel work and jewels of the day also refer to the crux gemata, the jeweled cross, which is the symbol of resurrection. And when these, pa these words explode across the page, becoming an icon in their own right, I think Aadfrith is preempting the decision of Hebrew and Islamic scribes later in the face of concerns about iconoclasm and idolatry, that rather than depict the divine in figural human form, it is perhaps wiser to use an aniconic form in which logos is literally the word made flesh, the word made word. Okay. So the words themselves become the icon. And you can see again that different script systems, Roman capitals, Greek letter forms, Celtic ogham, Germanic runic style letters, all coming together again like different language traditions, it being acceptable now to think about translating into English as one of the lingua sacra, Bede on his deathbed in 735, translating the little gospel that speaks of the things that work of love, John, to share with his fellow country people. All of these different things all coming together in the visual semiotics to depict harmony. 
and other forms of intertextuality going on. Now, within Germanic, Anglo-Saxon and Celtic metalwork, um, most animals look like the love child of an elephant and a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> um, this is the Sutton Hoop um, shoulder class. But by the simple expedient of introducing recognisable flora and fauna, Eadfrith is unlocking more of your potential intertextual response. Um, if you were familiar with early Christian commentary, you would know, for example, that the cat is the threat of evil, waiting to pounce on the unwary. Whereas for the Celts, he's the Cerberus figure, Kutna, the guardian of the entrance to the other world. And if we look at the page, you've got a solemn little procession of five birds on Monday morning, holding the tail feathers of the one in front, not looking where they're going, heading straight for the mouth of the cat, who swallow swallowed a satisfying supper of ten of them already. So your ability to decode ornament can be played upon in different ways. In the Lindisfarne Gospels, two of the evangelists are beardies. And art historians have said, oh, they've copied Greek models. That's fine. The other two are clean-shaven. Now, this is actually the neatest visual summary of the early um, medieval world of the position on orthodoxy. The great G8 summit tryout for the Sixth Ecumenical Council in Constantinople in 681 was held 10 miles north of London in Hatfield. So even the, those little islands are part of that big debate about the monopoly controversy. How could Christ be human and divine in the one package? A pope had been assassinated not too long ago over this very subject. Imagine those headlines. Yeah? A visual summary. The two beardies are the ones who exegete, such as Augustine, Gregory and Bede, tell us represent the incarnate Christ. Matthew, the man, the incarnation. Luke, the sacrificial immolatory victim, the calf and bull of the crucifixion. Decaying, mortal, ageing. Whereas the two eternally youthful and young are Mark, the Lion of Judah, kingship, resurrection, and John, Christ in majesty, shown at the second coming with the scroll of life, whose eagle flies directly to God from inspiration. Eternally divine, immortal. <coughs> the two faces reconciled like the harmony of every other aspect of the book, a fourfold harmony coming together. This is multivalent sacred figura at their most complex. And these are the things that could change the world. These are the big so-and-sos you're having to deal with, with their battle axes and their helmets, even if they're nominally Christian rulers. And the Lindisfarne Gospels, we think, was made to celebrate the cult of a former bishop, Cuthbert, who the minute he became bishop, um, if you like, uh, rather like Justin Welby leaving Lambeth Palace and putting up a tent on Parliament Square, goes on to his hermit's island outside of the king's fortress at Bamborough and, if you like, reminds the secular authority of the responsibilities that come with wealth and power. Here he is in a 12th century copy of Bede's Life of Cuthbert building his cell on that little island, rather like a Tyrell sky space for a different age. Reed reporting Cuthbert as saying, if only I could build a cell with walls so high that all I could see was the sky, I'd still be afraid that the love of money and the cares of this world would snatch me away. The king and the people, every time they looked out, reminded of the emaciated, vulnerable, indomitable Gandhi-like figure who devoted himself to a life of spirituality, of prayer, and of active work in the field of mission work and social justice related issues, and what he symbolised, like the books inside there, enshrined to <coughs> what he symbolised inside that cell visible on the horizon. Somebody who'd been involved in the sort of laws that the Columban Church are getting through at that time. The Law of Innocence, passed around 700. The first law in the world protecting non-combatants, women and children, in warfare. This is part of changing the face of society. These focal points, books like the Lindisfarne Gospels, which then as now are amongst the most visited books in the world, if the least handled, were the ones that transformed society. They were where you came to swear your legal transactions. They were where you came to free slaves. 
and kings were assassinated for doing just that, coming to a gospel book, swearing upon it, freeing slaves, forgiving enemies, having the documents written into the margins, and being assassinated for overthrowing the fabric of society, where hardened warriors brought up on the battlefield and the mead hall could on occasion embrace pacifism when they needed to win a war of a different sort. And this is um, another Lindisfarne manuscript containing the earliest document freeing slaves in the post-Roman world, added on this illuminated page to give it extra efficacy at law. Illuminated manuscripts could do a thing or two when they were scriptural. Only, I think, in Anglo-Saxon England around about 800 would you have an image such as this. It's part of a Byzantine iconostasis screen, but in Anglo-Saxon England... And you can see that the Virgin is based upon the Byzantine um, convention of the Virgin Hodogetria, the indicator of the way, who is always shown gesturing to the Christ child, the incarnate Christ as the way. Only, I think, in, the, in these islands again, could you have the Virgin gesturing to the book as the incarnation of Logos. Right, I really am going to whiz on and look at some other examples. The iconoclast controversy that besets Byzantium in the 8th and early 9th century, of course, um, causes uh, something of a, a disrupture of this shared early medieval response with a hard lining against images for a century and a half in Byzantium. Um, which is reflected again, I think, in the way in which some of the Western artists are picking up on these concerns and responding to them. Um, if you dragged your granny 300 miles for a miracle of healing at Cuthbert Shrine, you couldn't read the words necessarily. Somebody would explain them to you, like the <coughs> exhibition panels when you go to TCD and look at the Book of Kells. Yeah? You're part of a community of reading. What does that mean? Trinity, 10 years ago, conference on the Book of Kells, the four of us who'd handled the actual manuscript, having detailed discussions of making and using the equivalent of the planners of a work such as that initially. You, the monastic con communion, or the scholars at the conference, having your own detailed discussions with your privileged le level of access and understanding. Some of us going out and preaching in the field at a wayside cross, using the idea of the volume as a springboard into people's lives and things that we learned about it, or giving a public talk in a library or a community hall. The media, the sponsors, wanting their own privilege behind the scenes show and tell because they're given a champagne reception at the conference or 10 of the 300 or so calfskins for the original project. Meanwhile, you look out the window and there's the mile-long queue of the faithful waiting to spend their two euros to have their five minutes in front of the mystically lit volume, many of them having travelled halfway around the world in order to do that. Now, when you went there, you couldn't necessarily read it or access it directly, but it meant something to you in your life. And when you saw the spiral work here, you would be immediately at home because you might understand the Greek or, or anything else, but you would know that that's the style of metalwork that you had on the brooch inherited from your Irish great-grandmother. Whereas you, sir, would be intrigued by the interlaced animal ornament which adorned the belt buckle that your great-grandfather had left you from when he was a Germanic federal auxiliary in the Roman army. There's something of you and yours coming together in this rich Esperanto of art to symbolise a harmonised eternity, a coming together of faith, art and science within Bede's works and his hagiography and his biblical commentary that reminds me not a little of some of the ways in which we're exploring that interface in our envisaging of eternity today and our visualisations. And the principles of Euclidean geometry, of sacred geometry, the golden section, etc., used to inspire the substrata upon which the flora and fauna of creation work and are sustained by the word in a piece of artistry in which the technical solutions to achieve the vision are such that the guy invents the lead pencil and the light box many centuries before they're used in order to be able to achieve this rich vision on his little island. And experimental chemistry that leads him to move beyond the trisulfide of arsenic, the copper and the toasted lead that are commonly used in early manuscript illumination 
to emulate the rich palettes of Byzantium. And when I led a project to um, do a non-distractive Raman laser analysis of the pigments in Lindisfarne, we found that that 90 colours that Photoshop struggles with are all made with six local rocks and plants by somebody who's so in tune with his natural environment and knows that if you scrape that orchid lichen off of that rock, you can make 40 shades of purple to correspond with beads exegesis on the shades of purple and lilac representing the um, journey of the just soul based on the colours of the hangings of the temple. <laughs> you can get 40 shades by varying the acidity or alkalinity. Stal Ewan gives you a nice rich ruby red. All God's substances. Knowing how to manipulate that. He can't get lapis lazuli from Badakhstan in the foothills of the Himalayas, but he knows about it and he values its resonance. And so he fakes it by boiling up the local woad plant and um, floating crystals of hoof and horn animal gum in it to give the surface texture of ground lapis. Now these are some of the ways in which the materiality can open up the world, the spirituality, all sorts of different levels. And the words of Columbanus, nature is a second scripture in which we behold God. Again, something that would have informed the making of scripture and the use of natural resources by somebody such as this. This is another sacred figura in the Book of Kells. Now, at one level, this is... What do you think this is? This is Christ being tempted to throw himself off of the temple roof. And it's a very Syriac devil. But the place in the text isn't accompanying that part of the gospel narrative. It comes at a lection which would have as its homiletic material for that particular part of the year, the communio sanctorum, the communion of saints. At another level, this sacred figura is Christ as literally the head of the body of the church, depicted as a little Irish portable shrine, with the church triumphant already ascended, the church militant doing the work in the world, the church expectant awaiting liberation, with Osiris, god of the dead, presiding over them. And this, I love this, this is a Mercian bishop's book from around Litchfield in the 820s. Here it looks like quite a naive evangelist symbol, but it's done something different. It's not the full-length evangelist scribe identified by his symbol. It's reversed. And the captions are telling us that there's something different going on here. Hic Lucas in Humanitate. Here is Luke in his human guise. Hic Lucas formam acapit vitule. Does that ring any bells in anybody's mind? Well, that is placed on the passage in Philippians 2.7. It's taking key words, hypertextuality, the vocabulary of each of the images here, key words from liturgical readings. Philippians 2.7, which says that Christ made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a, cro on a cross, the sacrificial immolatory victim. The authoritative statement of the relationship between incarnation and atonement read as the epistle on Passion Sunday. Now you begin to see how some of these even quite naive looking images actually function at quite a deep patristic and exegetical level. Okay, I'm gonna... Will you forgive me if I whiz on to something completely different for the last bit? I mean, we could just work through the Middle Ages, but we're not going to be able to do that. So we're going to... You're going to have to have me back to do some of this. Sorry. I'm <laughs> <laughs> going to go to something completely different now. We've been looking at the early <coughs> Middle Ages. If we move to around... 1200, we start moving into an urban phase of specialist production in which clerical staff are still um, involved. We still have the mendicants working in book production circles. We still have clerks in minor orders, often um, serving as scriveners, illuminators, etc. And you get mixed interaction, as in this um, sorter from uh, Bamberg from around 1200. No, not Bamberg, Bavaria from around 1200, which shows mixed monastic and lay personnel participating in the making of a book. 
the ruling, the cutting to size of pages, the layperson doing, in this case, the single page miniatures, and the monastic scribe doing his work. This is a romance made in the piazza in front of Notre Dame de Paris. And next time you're there, if you go to the far side of the piazza, go down into what looks like the car park underneath. And you'll find yourself in an almost non-visited museum where you've got the basements of Christine de Pizan's workshop and all of the great stationers <laughs> and illuminators' houses. You can walk through the streets and just visit their basements where they stored their works, etc. And this is a depiction from 14th century Paris from uh, the Romain de Favelle showing a scribe hanging his work up to dry. Each time you write on one side of a sheet of vellum, you've got a hang it up to dry before you can turn it over and write on the other, let alone do any of the other rubrics or the decoration. And here you've got a woman taking part in the work as well. And the proto-guild system, women had better opportunities in book-related um, crafts than anywhere else. They could inherit businesses from their husbands and fathers and run them independently um, in their own right, hence somebody like Christine de Pizan. And if you look at Donald Jackson's story of writing, you'll see some of the telltale signs, things that we're going to be looking at, um, some of us in this week, about how the different instructions were left from one person in the production line to tell another um, what thing to paint. The scribe here has written a little XV to show the person coming in with the chapter numbers what to paint. These are instructions to the illuminator telling him what initial... Uh, iconography to have, etc. All the investigative telltale signs. This is an artist who didn't like the drawing that the original artist did and painted a completely different D <laughs> over the top. And this is the layering of the different stages of illumination. You would have people who spend all day, every day, just laying on touches of disembodied gold onto drawings, etc., because the gold goes on first because it's such a messy um, part of the procedure, etc. So broken up into individual trades and functions, but still with an overlap. Here you've got an early 16th century scribe with his wife bringing him a pint, um, but here you've got a monastic scribe still um, plugging away uh, and correcting the script. If you go to somewhere like the University of Pavia and peek through the windows, you'll still see the same 14th century um, desk structures and things and the pulpit that the professor... Um, uh, uh, extols his work from here um, and you'll see that the students are still sitting there but they've got iPads now um, <laughs> some of the students who were wealthy enough commissioning copies um, of works from notaries or buying them off the peg from university stationers um, works made uh, with Pessia piecework exemplars that scribes would hire by the gathering and do the work quickly and get it back to the, um, to the stationer so that he could unite it with the work of the next guy in the next street and bring all the work together. Authorised textual exemplars issued by universities. Some of them, however, simply aren't um, well enough healed for that and would literally just write their own lecture notes and use those as the basis of their studies. And this is, what, this is one such. This is a fascinating meeting of worlds. This is a 12th century Irish scribe, Mel Bright, from Armagh, working in a conservative style that could be 8th century Irish. But the glosses that he's written in the margins are based on his own lecture notes that he took viva voce from Peter Lombard's lectures in Paris. A meeting of worlds. And of course that sort of work gives rise to the wrap round gloss text where you could have three, four, sometimes even more texts working by wrapping round each other, different commentaries. Peter Lombard's commentary on the epistles, for example, that you see here. And these in turn lead to the production of the Paris Study Bibles, based ultimately on the Vivarian work, Chalfrith's work and Beads and Wilmer's Charo, Alcuin's <coughs> at the court of Charlemagne, feeding into the text which becomes the basis of the theology tripos at the great universities of Paris, Oxford, etc. And by the 1230s, the technology and the specialist class developed in such a way that you could produce a single volume Bible that was the format of the sort of Gideon Bibles that we still have in our hotel rooms, that every <coughs> mendicant graduating in theology would be given a copy of to take out with him to fuel his preaching. Okay. Remarkable transformation of structure with cheap and cheerful little initials such as our Jesse tree here if you weren't too well healed or very glitzy stuff if like William of Devon 
studying in Paris from Oxford in the 1260s um, you could afford. And then feeding over into other forms of visual instruction. These are sometimes known as the Biblia Pauperum, although there's not much poor about them. The Bible Moralise, of which we have seven surviving, produced in Paris from the 13th to 15th century, thought initially to have been put together by someone unknown, um, David might have more to tell us about that, for the royal family in France. Based as, do they remind you of anything, these images? Stained glass? Yeah? Okay, that sort of world, where you've got complex visual typology, where the Old Testament precursors of passages and figures in the New, David as the Old Testament type of Christ, for example, a typology that Jerome, Isidore, and Bede had favoured, coupled with sentences that give you the biblical passage or caption for it and draw out something of its moral and allegorical interpretation. Thousands of images within the one set of volumes. Things like the speculum historial, the speculum natural, in the speculum myus of the Dominican, um, early 13th century Dominican scholar Vincent of Beauvais, seen here in a copy made in um, Ghent and flogged to Edward IV of England. Um, it wasn't made for him. Uh, the stationer had left the arms blank and painted them in once he got a, a, a well-heeled customer with his speculum, his mirror at his side. Um, other people who, who bridged the, um, the scribal copying of scripture and other forms of work, such as the St. Albans monk Matthew Paris, who is shown here in self-portrait before the Virgin and Child, who was also a great chronicler and rapporteur. This is his account of how the Welsh Prince Griffin fell from an upper room in the Tower of London. It was one of the great scandals of the day. Did he jump or was he pushed? This is Matthew saying in visual terms, well, um, he didn't tie the knot too well in the bed sheets. Okay. Traditio and innovatio. How do you reconcile received wisdom with experimental wisdom, given that innovation is a heresy for much of the Middle Ages? Well, this is Matthew drawing an elephant and castle from the bestiary tradition. And you'll know that the elephant has no kneecaps. <laughs> That's because Pliny tells us full well, in part of the bestiary text, that the elephant has no kneecaps, and that's why you take your life in your hands if you fight on their back, because rather as in Star Wars, once one of these big guys goes down, he can't stand up again, because he hasn't got any kneecaps. <laughs> Matthew, however, <laughs> sees an elephant, the first Westerner that we think actually gets a chance to draw one. Henry III is given a, a, an elephant for the Royal Zoo in the Tower of London in the 1240s, and Matthew goes along, oh dear, it's got kneecaps. <laughs> and such is the scholasticism of the day that even monkish Matthew has to put what he sees in. Traditio and innovatio, always working in balance. This is William de Brailles, um, who with his wife Selina ran an illuminated shop in um, Oxford, just next to the Bodleian in Cat Street, and who around the 1240s develops the first fully-fledged Book of Hours, the great tool to allow the laity to buy into the celebration of the divine office in an abbreviated form of psalmody and prayers that becomes the mainstay until the Book of Common Prayer, along with the Psalter. And the, um, the performative aspects of reading something of this, very important. This is the Hours of Mary of Burgundy from the early 15th century, and this is a complex image. We have here the patroness of the book, shown reading the very book that you are looking at in a chemise binding with her prayer beads, her flowers symbolising purity and virginity, the dog on her lap, fidelity, perceiving through the window herself and her spouse being presented to the virgin and child before the altar of communion and thereby earning time off of purgatory for good behaviour for herself and all those whom she held dear. The function of the book conveyed in a complex fashion and the rites of passage that you went through, the marking of the times of the year, whether you were the Duke de Berry or a merchant in Bruges or Ghent, all marked in this way. And finally I leave you with Sir Geoffrey Luttrell, 
a different man. What's he got to do with spirituality? One of the big boorish knights of the day, the eve of the Black Death, the 1330s in East Anglia and Lincolnshire, one of the great wool barons. This is his sorter. Here you can see Gloria Patri Dominisca Fridus Luttrell Mayfieri fake it. For the glory of God, Geoffrey Lutch will have me made. Not too much anonymous about this. And here he is, a knight, on top of his war charger. He left this to the parish priest, a bit like leaving him your Ferrari. Yeah. Um, and here we have his wife and his daughter-in-law giving him his crested helm, etc., symbolising all of the land mergers and business mergers that Luttrell PLC have made through marrying wealthy women folk, who are again are vested in the company. Um, a Dallas of their day, perhaps. <laughs> but Sir Geoffrey takes his religion very, very seriously. His will survives. Now, making a book of this sort would cost about 20, 25 pounds. Now, the turnover of one of the big barons of his day on one of his major estates, we know from the visitation rolls, etc., and the post-mortem inquisitions, is about 22 pounds per annum. So he's blown the company turnover for a whole year on making a book such as this. That's a lot. For his funeral, he stipulates that 20 pounds worth of candles are to be burnt. That's more than, than a royal funeral. He says that 100 pounds is to be given away on the day to the poor who attend his funerary feast. And on the, de the anniversary of his death, another 20 odd pounds each year is to be given to them. He pays five clerks in perpetuity, or as long as the money runs out, to pray for his soul and sing psalms from the Psalter. Now this is somebody who is really concerned <coughs> about his immortal soul and who is an alms giver on a royal scale. Okay. So just a little bit about him. He doesn't just have himself depicted, and in a way this isn't just the knight on his, on his horse, as we'll see in a moment. He has all of his people, the common people of the field and the hall and the kitchen shown, who never make it in to the pages of history. At one level, this is a literal depiction of a plough on the eve of the Black Death. And reenactment societies have reenacted and, you know, tried them out experimentally. It works. But at another level, already with Cattle Moraine, you'd be looking at a mixed um, team of about 12 mixed equine and bovine plough teams at that time. This is the four evangelists preparing, ploughing the ground for the reception of the word, other forms of visual exegesis related to the Psalms above. So Geoffrey Luttrell, already too old to get on his war horse when this was made, he's an old man at 42, he couldn't be going off to war. He spent 30 seasons in the field, militarily, as well. And here we have the womb of the dawn, who's referred to in the text above, handing him his helm for the fight as he goes off to fight with his own humility, to do... Um, to fight with death, and also, if we look at the psalm opposite, the beginning of Psalm 109, 110, depending on your, um, on your version, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your <coughs> day of battle. Arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn, you will receive your youth. And of course, Sir Geoffrey has spent most of his life making of Edward I and of God's enemies a footstool. The Scots <laughs> and the French. So again, another form of visual exegesis going on there. And the book being commemorated and used at his obsequies in his local parish church. Here we can see his envisionment, if you like, of his shivering soul heading off for judgment and the clerk singing from the Psalter in that church. Now, he's gone to Norwich to commission his book initially. These are Norwich artists, three of them working together. And, you know, you've got your conventional scenes that you could have in your marginal counter that help you understand the text or gloss it in different ways. This is, what's this? Come on. The Annunciation, okay? But already you know that even within these conventional artists, they've been given a brief to go off-piste. 
They're doing things that they probably shouldn't ought to. And this is the most out there book of its day, iconographically. Who's this woman? Red hair, always a dodgy sign. Uncovered. <laughs> Whilst the Virgin, in her humility with her book, uh, her book of hours, accepts the word of the Lord and his instruction, there is no way that this young woman is going to get anybody to tell her what to do about anything. The forces of chaos lurking forever on the margins of society, threatening to overthrow divine order, divine stability. The murder of Beckett, where here you can see the little grotesque who summon others from the margins, who on the top appear as men but underneath a pure beast, summoning others to take part in the dirty work. Here, more edifyingly, here we have the little acorn encouraging this figure to step up to the mark and to emulate the good works of Martin of Tours, the military saint who splits his cloak with the beggar. Again, something up close and personal for Sir Geoffrey's own history. And here, the Dominicanes, a pun on the Dominicans, <laughs> about to unleash their hounds and find out the sins. And of course, Geoffrey Luttrell um, employed Dominicans on his household payroll so that he wouldn't have to confess to the local parish priest who might blag for the bishop because he's supporting the Lancastrian party and he needs to actually keep things in the household. And we think, I think that this is his spiritual advisor, William of Fotheringay, the Dominican, with his little assistant here. And this is the January, the Epiphany feast, looking back into the old year, forward into the new. Now, Complex image. This is Sir Geoffrey, shown as the great high priest, the pater familias, holding the chalice to his mouth whilst his sons hold up the Eucharistic wafer at the feast. His young um, daughter-in-law with her fashionable up-to-the-minute ermine sleeves dipping in the gravy, um, totally preoccupied with other things, and his wife nattering away while she carves the, um, the, the chicken, not really looking at what's going on or understanding. And who's this figure with the Jewish prayer stole and the withered hand? This is the um, butler, uh, John of, of, of Layford, who got all the silver and pewter ware and the tapestry in Sir Geoffrey's will. He really liked his staff. Yeah. Now, this, I think, is our artist. Although the main book was commissioned and written in Norwich and three local artists did the bulk of the work, the middle part of the book, the margins are all illuminated by just one figure in this quirky little style. And he's the one who's up close and personal with the family and the manorial life. He's the one who's making all the money. And he beats the Luttrells up mercilessly and makes them look at themselves at every stroke. And these are people who knew Ro um, uh, Roll, who knew Robert Manning of Bourne, who had them at their table. Geoffrey's sisters had Roll as their personal confessor. And so these are the big preachers of the day who are putting him through the spiritual ringer. Now, it's a good party, but they shouldn't be legless yet. <laughs> that was worth a laugh. Um, and obviously at one level we're recollecting the Last Supper on a nearby folio. And they've got the legs. And look at this little figure who, Judas, who in a way is signalled by this figure. And if we look at the psalm above and the way in which, again, the hypertext works, we have, um, uh, they have mouths but cannot speak. Eyes, look at how they swivel up, but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses that cannot smell, hands that cannot feel, feet that cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So you see how it's picking up and citing the family and their world within the ongoing biblical landscape and the cry de profundis that generations immemorial have used the psalms to express their hopes, their joys, their fears. Finally, unpack this for me. We could just look at individual little motifs. Sometimes we're just looking at an individual word that triggers <coughs> something in the artistic response, etc. Here you've got a protracted meditation. I think what's going on here and here we're looking at Psalm 89. You rule over the surging sea. When the waves mount up, you still them. Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings, etc. Well, here you've got Sir Geoffrey depicted in a boat 
with his traditional headgear like his cosy cardigan, his howling sins propelling him in the wrong direction like Monk's scream, whilst truth and mercy referred to in the neighbouring text haul him in the right direction towards the snail who leaves its silver trail along the page, picking up on the words in Lumine above. But with your intertextuality and your inner library, you would know from your understanding of bestiary texts that the snail is the symbol of humility because it draws in its antennae when faced with righteous authority. What more righteous authority than Luke, the symbol of the sacrificial victim, Christ and the Redeemer on the cross, and also as a nice little side reference, Taurus, the nickname of Edward I, whom Sir Geoffrey had served through his long and auspicious career, leading to the Princess Diana of her day, Edward's wife Eleanor, who died in Lincoln and who on her journey of her body back to um, Westminster, an Eleanor Cross was put up at every part of the journey. And here you see the funerary pennant, the elevation of the ultimate image of saintly royal authority elevated. So Geoffrey's sins pulling him in one way, truth and mercy compelling him towards humility and the service of God's righteous authority um, and service of his representative, the state, which leads to the righteous elevation of the just. What seems to us like a very secular work full of buffoonery, of follies, of jest, of grotesques, of nightmarish proportions, of comic hilarity and mirth, all coming together to a very complex and very profound spiritual understanding of what it means to be a worldling walking the path towards eternity and trying to actually hold the speculum up to you through the illuminated pages that your children will be taught to read from that the household, the servants, etc., would see, and which the poor would see when they came each year to receive their alms and to listen to the singing of the psalms for your soul as part of their reception of scripture. There's so much that we could have talked about. Um, I've just hope I've just given you a few other lines of inquiry of thinking how visual mnemonics, visual exegesis sacred figura and protracted spiritual meditation and preaching and teaching can actually be embodied in the pages of the book and how the act of making and the act of using change and are related across the centuries. Um, if any of you are ever working on anything that I can be of help with, I do hope that you'll let me pray to. It would be a, um, a privilege to help. If you look at something like Lindisfarne Gospels, I've highlighted how different elements in that, in that decorative repertoire can unlock different associations and different cultural and social um, cognizance yeah, and, and reference points. Now, that's not to say that those ingredients aren't around before. You know, someone like Dunad in Dalrida is taking apart pieces of Frankish network, pieces of Irish network, and putting them together in a new repertoire. What is different here is that you have that placed at the service of an intellectualized agenda 
which along with things like the fourfold harmony of different script types, different language types, etc., um, is, I think, a different way of understanding how you're using those to signify that participative, participative communion for a high-level intellectual audience, and not only for that audience, but before God, because it is a, an offering. The act of making and the symbolism of it is something which is symbolic to God, and it is signifying the participation of you and your people within that broader picture, <coughs> which is both temporal, horizontal, chronological, vertically, but which sits in an eternal matrix. Um, and I think it's an, a theological and artistic intellectualization for a specific set of social agendas. And one of the big agendas there, as I say, is that 7.15, when um, I can demonstrate that the book is being planned because it builds in lectures that are only um, incorporated into Roman manuscripts at that, that, that time. Um, it's an up-to-date statement about the healing of schism and the integration of those different church cultures of both the East and the West into a, into a healed orthodoxy. Yeah? So I, that's why I said there, I think it's different. The, the, the languages are, are around before that, but I think what you're doing there is taking it to a new level. Okay. Um, and what was the other, the first Just part? to say that the, the sense of the icons, icons, and, icons. And, and the echoes of icons, but I see those still as within the cultures, as they're living, they, they are icons. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. Um, I think what the distinction I would make, yes, I've, I've, I've indicated that I think you come very close to that in what I've tried to say about the spiritual motivation of somebody like A. Afrif working within the Eastern Eremitic tradition and being aware of those conventions, but still choosing not to go down the route of fully-fledged icons, still preferring the aniconic, the cross carpet pages, the logos interpretation as another. He's aware of the debate, etc., and he's careful about the sensibilities on either side. And icons, as we know, you write an icon, you don't paint an icon, and they are direct, open, hot wires to God of an intercessory nature. And I think there are some occasions where I think you could document and demonstrate that that perception is apparent in Western art, but mostly it's an attempt to both acknowledge but refute it. So things like the Libri Carolini of 789, where the whole thing is still being debated in Carolingian circles, and you've got Alcuin and Theodore of Orléans with very diametrically opposed views trying to come to an authoritative statement on how, yes, we understand what you're doing in the East about that, but that is not how you are to use them as members of the Western Church because they are not to be venerated in their own right. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you are content, join me in thanking a person who is actually now a visiting professor of Baylor University. <laughs>